I had a, the most fabulous time meeting interesting people. Peely being the perfect example. Yeah, well, you're talking about people who don't fit in. Exactly. I mean, who, <laughs> you look at Reed. He was the very person I was thinking of when you brought his name up there. Well, he, you think about John Peel and other Radio 1 DJs at the time. I mean, so, seriously. <laughs> all I can say about that, at that stage, Pat, is tell us about John Peel. The legend he is, and everybody that goes mm-hmm. around, the man who's probably responsible for more, more new music over the yeah. 40 years. If we, we, I mean, I, the stories in the book I, I won't bore you with. I mean, we, we became friends, I kind of engineered a meeting, which I've never done before or since. Um, I interviewed him for something I was writing for at the time. Yeah. So I, mean, I used to write for things, stuff under an assumed name because I didn't want to know people that I was doing it. And uh, we met up and it just immediately just got on, you know, because we, he loved his football. You know, I love football as well, but I was an outsider. He was an outsider in his music. I loved the music. Brilliant, as we all know, brilliant sense of humour. Staggeringly shy. Staggeringly shy, um, except within his own group. But I'll, I'll tell you one that kind of summed it up. I mean, Became great friends, we'd go for curries, whatever, I'd sit in in the shows, which is like a dream, an absolute dream for somebody who'd listen to it. And I'd sit in, he never said my name, and I'd, he knew. I didn't need to say, I don't tell people I'm on here, because it's not about fame or anything like yeah. that. He didn't need to say that. It was totally and utterly understood. Um, I and some, think that was your internship for the BBC. Well, exactly. <laughs> and the other interns, that we never, weren't called them then, they became great friends and Paget still to this day is one of my best friends. Over the years, Peel used to always have a five year, every five years they'd have a big birthday party. Uh, Sheila, I'll not say the pig. Sheila used to organise it. And they'd get a band to come along, a couple of bands to come along and have it in the house, Peel Acres, etc. Some years you get there, some years I couldn't. Uh, anyway, Sheila phoned up and said, yeah, could you come? And I, I said, yeah, I'll be there. Three weeks time or whatever. And it's in Suffolk. And at this point, I live in the borders. I mean, Suffolk's the end of the middle. And my wife said to me, you've got a golf charity game that you've agreed to, to help organise on that morning. Yeah. And, the, and one, the second part of it's the next morning. How are you going to get to Suffolk and back in that time? Uh, I said, I have to do it. I have to be there. It feels like I have to be there. And she, my wife went, well, fine. It sounds a bit mad, but my wife absolutely backing me to do it, right? I said that recently to somebody, and they wrote it as, my wife said I was mad, or, or she was mad at me. I, no, no, that, no, it was a mad idea. And she would say, well, go for it. So eventually, I've got a flight, played a golf game, got there, camera was good, favourite band at the time, were playing. Uh, Peely was brilliant that night. 12 o'clock, you know, get on a car that takes me back to the airport, have about three hours sleep up in the red eye from Stansted, and I'm on the golf course at nine o'clock. Right, so I've been there, and it was magical, it was brilliant. John died three weeks later. And to this day, I don't know why I did it, and I'd never done anything like it before, ever. But I'd said to my wife before I went, I need to be there. I need to be there. Something's telling me to be there. And uh, four weeks later, I was down for the funeral. And it was a bit of me to look back, and it was, it was a sadness, there's a moment, um, a while afterwards, where I bought a lot of my favourite music after hearing the Peel Show. A list of bands, he heard it in Peely. I, mean, I can tell you, I can remember the day, the first time I heard him playing Cocteau Twins, it, it was Waxing Wayne. And I went, getting that. And we went out and bought it and became a favourite band. I remember him doing the same with Camera Obscura. And I was one song, wasn't even by the end of the song, I'm like that with a pen, ready to write it down. And lots of bands like that, you know, and go-betweens. And I remember, I, a few months after that, Peely, one of his last sessions, he'd got the fall, obviously, again. And they played Blindness, which is an amazing track, uh, in the session. You and I remember- most recorded sessions, John Oh yeah, sessions the fall, after. definitely. Yeah, and I've got to greatly love the fall, I've seen them dozens and dozens of times. I remember going to a shop in Glasgow, funnily enough, I was up in Glasgow and I had to buy the new fall album, John's Now Dead. And I thought, honestly, I was in tears in the shop. This is the last time I'm ever going to go in and buy a track that John introduced to me to. So he's true. And it was, it was like, a, it was one of the most, it's hard to explain to people who don't feel that way about music. Yeah. It's a completely life-changing thing. And uh, selfish, obviously missing what he was going to give us, but also, God, how are we going to find this stuff now? And, and a lot of us did, and we share stuff. And, yeah. But it's hard that, 
Because you, you used to have one guy in the middle of it all who would give you the ideas, who did such amazing, interesting ability to see this genius music from within this rough, as cassette as it used to be or whatever. Um, but it was lovely, and there's so many nice memories now. Um, I always find it strange to tell you there are people who refer to them, and obviously, um, although we've read bits and pieces over the years, I find it hilarious the, the things that pop out because here's the guy who's playing the Sex Pistols, here's mm. the guy who's um, discovering the undertones, mm. but here's the guy who loves Sheena Easton. Yeah, yeah. And Abba. I'm, not, I'm with him in Abba. But you have to remember where Peel had come from. You know, the perfume garden, all that stuff yeah, that he was yeah, on. I mean, there's a, there's a massive array. And one of the things he did teach you, which I, can, I, I don't know if I've ever told this story before. I'd done a couple of things for the NME, again, under assumed names or whatever. And uh, Adrian would say, oh, come in, you meet everybody in the, you know, the writers who I'd been reading, you know, this great writing. And I met them. Oh, shit. I wasn't impressed. I just thought, yeah, but you lot are just writing. And it was all snide. Mm. It was all clever, clever. And it was all like, yeah, but they're the artists you're saying this about. And it absolutely shifted my attitude. I thought, no, no, Peely doesn't do that. Yeah. There's no snideness about it. There's no nastiness about it. Why, and I've... Why he's acting like football journalists. Yeah, but, well... <laughs> The musos were more, they were more extreme, and they could they were writing a cleverer way, or what looked cleverer, you know, it was, it was a bit up itself a lot of the time. Mm. There's some great writers, some great music journalists writers, and some of them I like still to this day. So, but what you understood then is, wait a minute, Peely's doing it for the love of it. I don't know if a lot of them are. Yeah. There's a kind, they're doing it for self promotion. Peely was never doing it for self promotion. Did, did you feel that in your role that you? Were that you're maybe taking on a little bit of a mantle there? Did you feel that almost like an apostolic role? Uh, no, I wasn't trying to push it to anyone. You kind of live your life and you should live your life, I think, by being yourself and doing what you do. Now, some people don't like it. You shrug your shoulders and don't like it. Um, but always just be true to yourself. I mean, that's such a dreadful line. But see if you actually live it that way. Um, you're not telling everybody, you're not preaching. You're not, that's why I don't use the word apostolic, because that sounds a wee bit preachy. Yeah. It's not preaching. It's, my dad was like, it's all from my dad, this stuff as well, because he lived what I think is a great life. Never told anyone what, what to do. He just done it by being himself, and people respected him in the end for it. And I think that's a good way to try and be. So, no, it wasn't apostolic. I love the sharing, though. I and mean, anyone who loves music just loves sharing, don't they? They just love, oh, God, you've got, you've got this band. I and mean, they've got a whole bunch of people. Some of this, you, you mentioned Scottish journalists, uh, football journalists. Still four or five of them. We send each other songs still. Because they were into music too. Yeah. So I had more in common with the journals than I had with the players. Well, Funnily enough, I've got one of them doing a, a, a great friend of Sweeney's and doing a, an article for us in this edition of Pan and Arrow, Stuart yeah. Cosco. Yeah. Who obviously you know, you know very well. Sure, can I tell you, can I tell you once to... Can I tell you one story about Stuart? Oh, you got it now. All right. <laughs> this has actually was taken out of the book, and I fought for it to stay in the book. Uh, but I'll tell you, in the bit, the, the editor said, look, that's just because you know Stuart. So I was, uh, I was in Soho. Um, what was the name of that bar that was green around it? And it was where all the musicians used to hang out. No, no, not that was, no, it was a green oh. tree. No, it was, it was right just off uh, Shaftesbury Avenue, right on the centre. Oh, right down the bottom. Ket, Ket, Ketners, Ketners, it was called. Right, long time ago. So uh, I was in there one night, and uh, I'd actually no, I need to go back. I need to go back. I'd been out the week before with uh, Richard Jobson uh, for Skids, who's a great friend, uh, Jerry Kelly and uh, Peter, who was my next flatmate, and Peter is basically Jeeves. Um, and we'd been at a warehouse party, which years later would have been called a rave, but then it was called a warehouse party in South London. Anyway, we got chased, running through the streets, and there's Jobson and myself and Kelly, and it was like mental Saturday, night, well, two in the morning, three in the morning, running. Anyway, we jumped on a bus, got on a bus and went upstairs, and we sat down, and, Pissing herself laughing, and Jobson's 
and he looked at the front, there was two people sitting in the front, and it was two people with a big six six Sputnik haircuts. You remember them ones? Yeah. Big pointy ones. And we, we just looked at him. Jobson's turned around there. Blood, blood, didn't say bloody. Said, bloody f St. Johnson supporters, they get everywhere. <laughs> right, and I thought this is a great line in the middle of... So I was at Kettner's a week later. I was introduced to this guy, I was chatting away with him. Somebody bumped into me and I spilled my glass of wine. Can you use that line? <laughs> St. Johnson supporters, they get everywhere, eh? It was Cosgrove I was talking to. <laughs> <laughs> the only St. Johnson supporter within about 40 mile radius and a, and a fanatic as well. He went, what's wrong with St. Johnson? I went, what? Because I'm a St. Johnson supporter. Christ. And that was the first time I ever met Stuart. Um, but I really liked him. And, and I, again, a very, very good writer. And I love his books. Um, and it's a funny thing, I'm known for liking a lot of indie stuff in the rest of it just now. I've got quite wide Catholic takes, but that's the side of it that's kind of pushed a lot. But you know, Stuart stuff, he always winds me up because he's a very, very much a soul man. I love his stuff. I absolutely love it. And the Northern Soul stuff, I've always loved that as well. Um, but he has an absolutely stunning knowledge on it. But, you know, he's one of the writers who's he's still a fabulous writer. I mean, his yeah. books are fantastic. Really looking forward to, to having him on board for this edition. Mm -hmm. um, you've, you've touched on a couple of girls who, who brought Stuart Cross School. You talked about um, Richard Jobson and Jared Kelly. And mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do a bit more name dropping as we go, yeah. as we go through the process. Um, but... I had to kind of do, can I stop with Keep that in mind, right? Right. right. I was doing a, a BBC Scotland thing about two weeks ago. And I came back up. And, and it was after Scotland, Scotland game. This next morning we get beat again. And that was us out of the Euros. And uh, they asked me in the morning, was talking about, and there weren't some fun stories. And uh, I was going to tell them a wee story about Billy Gilmore. I'd met him at the Champions League final. And, and, oh, uh, I heard that on the yeah. I listened to the show. Yeah. There was a line right in the middle of it. I was like, what? I said, uh, I said, well, I was at the Chelsea game. And they all went, oh, you're talking about Chelsea again. And I went, oh, yeah, I kind of played there. And I made a bit of a joke about it. I'm thinking, all right, I won't tell you the story then. It's a brilliant story about Billy Gilmore, and it's a brilliant story about, and we've got this other story about Billy, and I thought, all right, I will not tell you about it. And they missed this other phenomenal story that I had, which I'm happy I didn't tell, because I can keep it for some other time. So it's kind of weird, the name dropping thing. It's not, it's just your mates. I'm, it's just I'm, the people you meet. I'm joking about the name dropping because it is actually one of your mates, but mm -hmm. he's a big hero of mine when I was a kid. And, um, your roommate at Tabla PG Waves from Scotland and Brian McLeod. Yeah, and, I Chucky. And uh, I noticed in the book you didn't call him Chucky, so I wasn't. I've sure never called him Chucky in my life. I just <laughs> mentioned it there because everyone else calls him. Oh, I call him Brian. And, and just doing, he said that was kind of not so much too outsider, but certainly too intellectual. It was a bit different from the rest of the boys. And you found a bit of a, a natural affinity mm. with Brian. And I seen the, in the book again, it mentions how you're taking out your enemy and he's got your copy of sounds. Okay. And you kind of kick things off. What would you say was the kind of shared influences or what was the music that you and I kind of shared as a friendship, well, the film friendship? We, we, we didn't have massive stuff that we absolutely agreed on musically. I mean, I liked a lot of their stuff. We both liked Billy Bragg, I remember that. Um, but, you know, he would like the birds or something and I would like, well, but he was different from everyone else. So I wanted to hear what he was giving us, right? And he would like stuff. Um, I can't remember if it was in that book. Actually, I've cut so many stuff out. I was at a gig with Brian. Fast forward many years, right? We immediately got on well because he was a complete outsider. Didn't really fit in with the players. Brian was a great teammate. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he got on with the heart, Paul McStay, got on with everybody else, fine. But he wouldn't spend his rest of his life with them, you know, or go away from work. I mean, I always ask people, do you really hang about with all the people at your work? Kind of don't, you know? So we were kind of like that. And, and at the time, the, the young footballers coming through were much of a muchness and style and interest. So we didn't have anything in common at that time. And we were learning about ourselves as well. But as soon as we walked into that, that, that bedroom in Largs, it was probably within five minutes. And he looked at me and said, and then he spotted the, the, the music paper and I spotted his and went, hmm, I might give him a chance. And it was immediately, it was great mates after that. I mean, Brian and I are incredibly different characters. Yeah. Brian is, the doerest and getting more so, but in an unbelievably, f hilariously dry way. I love his humour. It takes a lot of people a lot of time to get it. To, to see, to know the real chocolate, as they call him, to know the real Brian, you actually need to get him drunk, okay? <laughs> that's, that's when you find the real Brian, right? Because he's quite light in that way. Um, but it immediately became 
really, really good friends and desperate that he was in every squad if I was brought in the squad and if he wasn't, I was pretty gutted. It was so obvious that we would be friends, although we weren't exactly the same interests, types. We'd, we'd got the same background. We'd, he'd been at Glasgow Uni doing maths. I'd been doing a degree as well. So we'd, all those influences, but they were, we were both people who wanted to look outside of it at the time. And I was very close to getting him uh, to Chelsea. With, within a couple of weeks of getting him to Chelsea mm -hmm. when he was leaving Celtic and uh, things got in the way, uh, which is a bit of a shame. T can I tell you one wee thing about Brian? I can't remember if I said this, but we took him to a Cocktail Twins concert. No, Kids no, no, no. Cocktail Twins concert at, uh, it was in Manchester. And I'd loved the Cocktail And then they were really at their best at this point live. Because they originally were always known to be great live, but they were really, really great. And I'd given them a lot of stuff. And I was there with my wife and Brian was standing beside And after the four songs, they are absolutely amazing. They are Bat on the plates, it's fabulous. Brian's standing in the background going, giving it Brian McClare with a tooth stick in it. And I'm going, he looks so pissed off. He looks fed up, he looks bored. And eventually, I'm now no longer enjoying it because he's sitting down behind me going. So I've turned around, what do you think then, Brian? And he went, I'm in heaven. <laughs> so typical Brian. <laughs> and then classic Brian. Um, he's also he's a very good writer, Brian, as well. That's another thing that's kind of not greatly known about him as well. Really good human in writing. So immediately we would go on well, and it yeah. was great when we met up. Um, so by it, the time you moved then, you, you moved from London, Chelsea, you transferred to Everton. Um, so you've experienced that whole London scene, mm -hmm. the music, being at the, the centre of all the art and culture that goes along mm -hmm. with it. And then you, you moved to, to Liverpool, which mm -hmm. is a vastly different yeah. place. And, and I didn't go to Liverpool, to, I went to Chester. Chester <laughs> the, the, the club being there. Yeah. Um, and also Brian at that point would have been, he'd have just been in Manchester United yeah. four or five years by that time, wouldn't he? Yeah. Um, so obviously you've got a, a friend not too far away, mm -hmm. but then life takes a whole new musical, different direction then. It does. And this is an interesting because just about then, I went there 88, 89, and I was at Everton for four years. Um, and of course there's, yeah, I got married the next year. Um, we got to the FA Cup final. Peely came uh, with Sheila, and then he knew. He, I got him seats in the Everton end, and he wore a red suit, a bright red suit. I, I never seen it. I never. It's probably well, I hope not. <laughs> big lapels, but of course it was Peely because then and they didn't mind. He uh, still madly loved whatever he went in Liverpool. Um, but at that point in time, I was. The Hacienda, I'd gone to the Hacienda a few times, but I wasn't a big clubber at the time. But the Hacienda was just beginning, something was happening. When, when, when was the Hacienda? Well, I can remember the first time I went was, was 85, 86. Was it the But I'm trying to think. No, it was 84, 84, 85. It's the first time I went to Hack. Uh, and there was nobody there at all. Nobody went to the Hacienda. It was dying. Mm -hmm. It took a long time for the house to end it really hit. So it took Manchester and it took that massive change in music, the dance music coming in. But you, you knew the other personality from then as well, um, Mr. Fracture Records himself. Ah, oh, Tony. Um, I love Tony, but I had this thing about, I knew something about Tony that maybe some others didn't. I'd had this teacher once at school, John McLaughlin, and he had this brilliant shtick where he would just bullshit. He would just say something that was so obviously wrong to create the dynamic of an argument or a discussion within the group in school. Mm -hmm. It's a great technique, but I kind of worked out quite quickly. He's just winding them all up, and I was quite earnest at that, and I used to get wound up by it. And then after I'm thinking, no, he's just creating your argumentative techniques. And it was a great thing, and then he then played on the character. So he's just playing a character. I met Tony the first time, I thought, that's exactly the same shtick you're doing just now. You're just saying things for pure effect a lot of the time. You don't believe them, but you'll say it with this kind of strength of feeling sounding. But you'll know there's a wee smile behind it as well. And I immediately got him. Um, I didn't meet him that many times, but there's a film in the film, I can't remember which of the factory films it was, um, where he buys this table and he shows it to New Order, who go mental because it's 10,000 pounds or whatever it was, right? in their skin, and he's spending the money on this work of art table. He showed me the table before he showed them it. <laughs> and I remember going, what? 
for a bloody table. And he went, no, 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 it's art. And I'm going, I think it was hung for the ceiling and things like that. And I'm like, are you mental? I mean, I love art and I love creative, but come on, it's just a big, weirdly shaped thing. And he spent this huge sum of money on it. And I think he was testing me out before he tried it in the back. <laughs> he went mental with him. So the, I, I went a few times. I would go to gigs at the hack more than anything else. But when Manchester really started, the Mondays and the Roses and that were coming, uh, it was round about the time that my son was born. And then life did change. So the chances to go to right. and live in that music, which I would have been all over, no doubt. Um, and I'd, I'd have been, I'd have, I mean, I did buy the, all the early Monday stuff, etc. I was, I didn't go to it. I just didn't get to it, you know. And so you mean you all the empty days and then missed the days? With the so so I, I missed that whole grouping. So it was, and my daughter was born three, four years later. So there's this huge gap where I was hearing the music, but I wasn't going to see it. And I was getting babysitters and things like that, or whatever, to get out for a night. And you're exhausted as, yeah. as a young parent. So there's this whole period where the, the things I should have been going, or I'd like to have been going to see, I wasn't. But I was still going to see stuff, and I think maybe a wee bit after that was Radioheads, and if the Blue Nile were down, I'd go and see them, or whatever, this Danny Wilson's. But there were more, they weren't the happening things. Yeah. Uh, Radiohead were, but um, it was harder for me to go and see gigs. And I, I, I had a, a real four or five year loving music, listening to music, being into it, but not getting the gigs. And I, it, it was horrible. Well, that, was, of, that, that takes us rather neatly to the content of the, the magazine and mm. in an era you mm. missed but an album you'd be aware of mm. um, so this time around and, and obviously the magazine coming out in September it's 30 years since the release mm. of um, Scream and Delica mm -hmm. and we're, we're covering that quite widely in the magazine do you remember it at all? From well what I remember is when I'd, I'd put the early stuff so I got all the early Primal Scream singles oh, right. so I had Velocity Girl I, had, I mean so I was so, Sonic yeah, yeah, because that was the, the first album. The second album was Primal Scream, right? And then, and I remember because I all the Glasgow stuff, like back scenes, and the rest, there was a lot of kind of Glasgow stuff at the time, which was dead interesting. And did you still keep a bit of thing going? And around? I was all yes, you know, I was all over it, absolutely all over it, because you're still hearing Peely, you're still listening to a lot of stuff, and basically, if you're a period of time where I used to uh, have to drive to get the kids to sleep, um, and I'd be finding myself in North Wales listening to the Peel show or listening to a recording of it and you're hearing it that way. Always driving to training and driving back, I would record the show and that sort of stuff. So I was getting the stuff and I was desperate to see the bands at the right time. There was just so many bands. But funnily enough, the Primal Scream one was a weird one and I'll be absolutely upfront and honest with you. I'll say, why are you changing? I like that stuff. <laughs> you did that for you selling out, you know. And, uh, you said and then, Andy Weatherall's ripped at it. No, no, but but the time, but no, but then Screamadelica happens, and then you go, ah, got it. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm right. I, I absolutely get it. And you know, it was an, an odd time because you know there was a change in different styles that were happening at the time, and uh, you know, punk was an easy one because it was a mental shift from yeah. prog rock and right up to punk, right? And you could see it. But the kind of dance, rave, Manchester, all that sort of stuff. It was kind of, it was pocketed in different ways. So, I mean, I would have got um, a guy called Gerald and all that sort of stuff, right? And there was a whole bunch of things that I was just touching on and getting, um, but didn't know everything about it. But Screamadelica seemed to kind of pull it all together. I mean, you know, as much as uh, I wrote for Luck and stuff like that with the Mondays, there was a lot of stuff that you said, oh, yeah, that's it, nailed. You know, that's exactly where it should be. Oddly enough, what put, killed it for me a wee, a wee bit at the time is when you got the real rave stuff. Um, I'm a footballer, I can't do drugs. And I've never done drugs. But you can't do drugs. You can't do these. You can't do all that sort of stuff. And you certainly won't be staying up to four in the morning, giving it all that, right? So it's kind of wasted. And to be honest, listen to that stuff unless you're in the right space and doing the right stuff. It's kind of not convinced by it, really. So that whole side of that, uh, you know, the heavier stuff, Peely would play quite a lot of it at the time. But it didn't sound right in the spaces I was listening to it. Right. But I also knew that if I was in the place, the venue, the field, the whatever, you would get it. It just wasn't any opportunity for me. So there was a big period then. So I, funnily enough, I started 
pushing other parts of my life at a time that I wanted to see. So I learned a lot more about opera, I learned a lot more about, you know, again back into ballet and stuff like that again. I learned other things. I just wanted to find out other things because I knew I couldn't follow that. Because my, my life, my job, everything was impossible for that to do at the time. But it was nice because every now and again there is a couple of things they break through and crack through. Mm -hmm. And Scream of Delica was the most obvious of them all, I think. So by the end, the, when I finally, I actually got to see Primal Scream the first time um, five years ago. Right. Five years ago. And it was my mate Colin Murray was putting on a, a thing uh, down in Liverpool. Uh, and it was, it was a brilliant thing. It was a quiz thing. And, it was, and they got Primal Scream to play. I was DJing. And it was just like, this is a place to be. This is really what you want to do. And they were brilliant that night. And I met, because um, I'd never met Bobby or any of them before that. Um, the other thing you need to add to this, see the Screaming Delicate thing, see with Bobby and that. I'd been a big, big Jesus and Mary Chains fan. Yeah. From really early days. This mega, like, second single. Go and see them in London. They did an ICA show where they basically turned their back and them everybody in the room, about 50 people there and just made noise and then went off again. they played in London. I had the first one the Ambulance of Fire Engine plays or whatever it was. Um, so I'd been, I'd loved them so early days. So I then just started following the Reed Brothers more than Bobby for a while. Uh, but there were so many different things coming out. And Glasgow was still just continuing to produce phenomenal stuff. And then also you had um, another, another friend in the magazine, Alan McGee in London, and mm -hmm. like creating these creation stuff, which also Primal Scream were a part uh -huh. of. Was that, you were still in London at that point, was mm. he someone you were aware of? Was the, the label yeah, no, everyone was aware of, well, creation was Jesus Machin, so yeah. I knew them from, from that one. So if anything comes out in creation, you'll be interested in it, so you listen to whatever he's putting forward. And some was good, some was bad, some was, didn't touch me. Um, but creation was, it was the right label, you know, and it was, a, it was a brilliant label for the time. I mean, certainly I've loved watching the movies a bit because whereas, a lot of people, I, mean, I used to know everyone from 4AD, uh, you know, and you know, the factory people, where creation comes a lot of the time, where I'm not in that milieu at all. Yeah. I'm listening more than being part of it, which is fine, it's good. The music's the music, you know, you want to love the music. Um, I never quite got the, I'm not, some of them, see, I never got the Oasis. I never quite got it. And I know we're in the place where it kind of, they were first spotted by, by Alan. Uh, I remember at the time being asked, uh, the correct answer, what's the correct answer, you know, Oasis or Blur? You know, of course, Blur, Chelsea fan as well, you know, yeah. uh, Damon was a Chelsea fan, but, and I played football actually, fun enough with Damon, not a bad player. Um, and of course, the correct answer between Oasis and Blur is Pulp. And I've always felt Pulp was the right answer with that whole thing, that whole kind of pretty poppy kind of thing, because yeah. Pulp were hitting this, and I'd loved, loved Pulp before that as well, but they, they took this really phenomenal two or three album period, which was just blown, blew me away. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I remember at that time, I wouldn't have missed, wh whatever was the case, I wouldn't have missed Pulp. I didn't miss them. I, the kids would have had to stay with Annabelle and, uh, you know, you can deal with that. I'm off to see Pulp. But I, don't, I don't think John Peel was a massive fan. Oh, no, he loved, he loved Common people, uh, and no, that, I mean, that was. Generally, oh no, he wasn't. No, no, he wasn't. I mean, certainly not Oasis, but he wouldn't like Oasis. That was too mainstreamy, mm -hmm. and kind of rock orientated, and it kind of wasn't new. It was kind of for the people. Yeah. Which is not wrong with that, but he's wanting to break a new thing. It's, it's not as derivative or whatever. Um, and it, you know, the Oasis will tell you there's lots of derivative stuff, but then everyone's got something that is derivative. But no, you wouldn't have been listening to that. But he did. He did like some blur stuff. Um, I certainly played some of that stuff. And you certainly the earlier stuff. Yeah. Do. I remember you were talking about 1991, mm -hmm. I think Blair, 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 Blair,
you listen to the first album and you know, a few years down the line you think, did I, did I like that? <laughs> you know? And some of it, it, it just was of its time. But that wasn't the stuff that I was kind of going for at the time. Um, but there was still, always still a lot of stuff going on. What was the weird thing was that period was difficult. I thought it's only going to be a, a small period of time. After that, I ended up, I come up, I went to, I was trying me, I was, I was at trying me for four years there. Too. So I was basically in that area for that period of time. But the kids were really young. But I always knew you're back into again. It's okay, most music won't go away. New acts, new ideas, and you innovative people won't go away. Um, and I always knew I'd be back into it. And if, you know, and then there was a period after that, I came back up for a year here with Kilmarnock. But I was living in Chester, but I was commuting from Chester to Kilmarnock, great. Um, that nearly killed me a few times. Um, but other things were starting to happen, like you know, the Bells, Ben Sebastian were, you know, and there was, like, and amidst all this, it's not, people always think it's these chopped off eras. It's not like that. Yeah. I always love Teenage Fan Club. What's the area? It's forever. You know, so that but I came back up and I had a year here where I had to spend time. I was on my own a bit. Um, and I went to see so many things because I was back in Glasgow after being away for all these years. I had a flat that was renting here. I'd been, and I was, honestly, I was in this place all the time. I was, honestly, I was one night here. Where you're sitting, band's up here, and it's Pete Wiley. He's playing right. So I remember Wah. I don't even remember, but Wah, they always had different names, Shambiko say Wah, or Wah Heat, or, you know, millions of different names, but always had Wah in it. So Wiley's up there, and I know Wiley, because I'd done a radio show for a while, and Wiley done it a bit with me down when I was at Everton. And uh, I'm standing, I'm standing there, he's on here, and he's going, and this was the thing, can you remember, what's his name, Salmon Rushdie? Yeah. He was in all sorts of shit because of he'd, uh, the, what's the name of the book again? Um, Satanic Versus, yeah. thank you. Um, anyway, so he's standing there and he goes, hey, what do you think? I should, I should get a new name for the band tonight. What do you think we should call the band? And we're in King Tut's Wah Wah Hut, right? And he's going, any ideas? And I went, Fat Wah, because <laughs> he's put on the pounds. He's like, oh, but he's really pissed off and he's like, oh, he's really angry. Anyway, I'm, I walk, seen him afterwards and he goes, was that you, you bastard? Because <laughs> <Yes. laughs> he's a motor, he's a motor mouth anyway, yeah. but he laughed at it afterwards. So it was, I'd go to see a lot of bands uh, yeah. around Glasgow and here. You spoke about the, the radio show and obviously the journalism for the NME, so DJing is a natural mm. for you then? I'd always done it anyway. Um, it's just that I'd done it quietly. Um, like a lot, I've done a lot of things in my life where... It's another reason for writing the book. You know, people get an idea of you, and they kind of don't know. They, they, they only see, I mean, particularly in Scotland, Scotland's weird because they see me in the telly. When I was doing, BBC, used to do BBC Scotland. God knows what they thought. Because <laughs> that's all they see, this guy sitting talking shit about football. Um, so I kind of thought, wait a minute, you might as well get, you know, explain to people. But I didn't like people knowing the things I was doing because I wasn't doing them for fame or to be loved or that. I just don't because I like doing it. That's why you do things. That's why I do things. So I've been DJing for quite a long time. But what happened was I'd been asked to do uh, the Bowley Weekender and it's, uh, it's down uh, south. I can never remember, just south of Bristol. can't remember the place. It's in a... Uh, Mainhead. Man, that's it. Mainhead. I'm really happy you've We've got some okay, intelligent people. Aye, ah, good. Out, so it's, it's exactly what. So I, I was down there and they, they'd asked me to come down and DJ. And I went, yeah, I'll, I'll come down. Because the bands that were playing were Bells, Gamma Obscura, and Julian Cope, and Franz Ferdinand. And I was just like, yeah, of course I'm going to. And they had me as the last night after, after the Bells had played. I go and DJ. And it's a brilliant night. And it's a piece of cake. It's like, my people. Like, you know, you know how to touch every button there. So it was a phenomenal night, and every time, and all the people that were playing the bands all came in for that night as well. So there was three or four other DJs in other places, but they all seemed to congregate towards my room. And it was mental, they were all jumping about. And every time so somebody like Alex Capranis would walk in and start dancing at a tune, I'd put on Franz Ferdinand straight off again, and I'd do it at every one of them when they would come on to dance. Yeah, I did the same thing Stuart, I think, for the bells. Anyway, um, I was driving up the next day, and I was. I was taking a band up to Manchester. They had, they had to get to Manchester, and I was doing a game the next day, Man City. And as I was driving, I 
sometimes started going weird. And I would, I did this thing where I would get band names into, always did put band names into commentaries, put band names that nobody knows. So this small number of us who know the band names. So I had to get the pains of being pure at heart into a commentary, right? Which is not easy, I can tell you, but to make it sound normal. And I managed to get it in. But after that night, it went mental. Everybody knew I was a DJ. I went, that's a bit odd, you know, it's, it's a bully weekend. It's just, why did that happen? Twitter started. <laughs> and I didn't realise before, you know, obviously I, nobody realised what happened to Twitter. I think people just started tweeting, saying, oh, it was great, my pap was brilliant, it was a great night. Was, and my secret was just gone in that moment. Um, the upside of it, I get asked to do lots and lots more. The downside of it, I've not got time to do them all. Um, so when I, I get a chance and it's the right sort of feel, right sort of place, yeah, I still do it now and again, but obviously not for the last couple of years. Uh, do you want to know how I got the pains of being pure at heart? Into the commentary? Yeah, come on. First this. of all, which game was it? Arsenal versus Manchester City. At the Etihad. At the Etihad. Okay. Right, so, watching the game, Man City are winning, and uh, Arsenal are doing their usual 49 passes, but no shots. And John Murray said something. I said, well, that's the problem that Arsenal have got, you know, because they work under Arsene Wenger, and he wants to make it everything perfect, too many passes, you know, and you're never going to lump it in, you're never going to have a long shot. It needs to be the the perfect goal and it's, it's a real shame that because I like what he's trying to do but it's just not successful but if you want to do it the right way and be a winner it's very difficult and that's his problem that's the pains of being pure at heart <laughs> <laughs> right. and of course John didn't know the hell you know I mean? it, it makes sense doesn't it it makes perfect yeah. sense right and of course anybody who's a pains fan goes, well, I just mentioned the pains um, so that, that's just, what just thinking you get a phenomenal turn of phrase. Exactly, which I was kind of happy with that. But we've kind of always done it with sort of band names or songs. I, mean, I remember once uh, uh, for a Scotland game and I promised Tracy Ann that I'd, uh, Campbell that I'd get a, uh, with her new single mentioned in sports scene. I managed to get four singles in one sentence <laughs> for, for the band. <laughs> in one sentence. No, of course nobody knows, noticed yeah. except people who like this wee band. Cause it, it, we would just starting out at that point in time. Um, but I actually introduced Camera Obscura on this stage. Anyway, so, um, so but the, the DJing's, the, I don't do it to make money, I don't make money out of it. Um, sometimes don't take any payment for it. Just get me there, get me back. For the love. Just because you like doing it. And you meet dead good, dead interesting, really nice people. And that's why you should do it. That's why I should do it. So the only DJing then, as you, as you kind of draw things to a, to a close, if you were to give us five records that the, the people of Pan and Arrow should mm -hmm. really check out, what would be your top five? Uh, you know, I wish we were being true to yourself and what? maybe not giving a message out as yeah. such, but if we were giving a message out to the people, five tracks to check out, recommended in Pan and See, it's not DJing once. No, you, I mean, I mean, DJing, you then, then it's danceable. Yeah. It's danceable, right. So then it kind of, kind of limits it. Um, I would say just anyone... From, just from your collection. Right, I, I would say... Right, I would just, I'm going to cheat and just say albums. <laughs> That's the answer, isn't it? Um, and I've, I've mentioned Cocktail Twins a few times and just love them. So, kind of any, but start early, head over heels. But if you want an in, go for Heaven in Las Vegas. Uh, really good stuff there. So, Cocktail Twins, Heaven Cocktail in Las Vegas. Twins, yeah. Um, I would certainly... I'll give you a new one. There's a band called La Luz, L A L U Z, um, just a single called Mean Dream. Just check it out. Oh, uh, a new one. There's a new. I mean, this is the classic. I could see is a million. Did you see that getting into the commentary the weekend? Uh, I think I've actually done that one. Um, but they're a Californian band, and they're uh, some good stuff. The new band I've mentioned a few times from Galway called New Dad. Uh, I don't. They've got a single called I Don't Recognize You, which. It's an it absolute crack. It was out last year, I think, in the last six months or something. And it's not that far away from My Bloody Valentine, but but much info as well. So, I mean, I, you'd want to basically see new stuff. I, I always mention the bands that I really love, like Camel Obscura, because, you know, I've, I had such a lovely journey with them and became great friends as well. Um, and certainly the first couple of albums. I would say that to them because if you listen to them, 
so let's let's wrap it up nicely and call that one 80s fan by Cameron Obscura, right? Because they've got a great track, track called Cam's. I went to see um we were talking about the last gigs we went to see before the lockdown, etc. I went to see Cameron Obscura up at uh, St. Luke's beside the Barath. Yeah. And one of the most amazing things happened that night, uh, which I can only remember happened two or three times, maybe probably possibly only twice in my life. She sang a song. Um and at the end of it, no one applauded, no one moved, no one done anything. Everyone just went, ah. Oh. And you've never seen, it's only, it's only twice I can remember in my life I've ever seen it. At a, so there's, there's different reactions, like, yeah, and whoa, and all that sort of stuff, and applause. And see that? The, ah. Oh. It was amazing. And uh, there's a lot of people in tears at the end of it. Now, there's a variety of reasons for it. Um, uh, but it was absolutely fantastic. So books written for girls, but it's it's a brilliant. But if I could only get a recording of it from that night, <laughs> the second night they played both nights, I went to both. So that was camera obscura. So if it's not that one, it would be eighties fun. Uh, never done four. I think that is funny. Is it? If it's if it's, well, if it's the first one was an album. Yeah. Okay. So okay then that'll do. Uh, if you if you do need another one, you find it. You got the wrong, wrong one. Get my phone. I'll just I'll put <laughs> I'll put ceremony I'll put ceremony on again. It comes up every time I go. Obviously, you're absolutely delighted. I said you're one of the names we, we spoke about when we first spoke about launching the magazine. Mm -hmm. um, and even better, the, the people came to us were, were good enough to let us come and use the facilities. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm really happy you never asked me about style. You've seen the pictures in the book. I'm <laughs>